Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining me uh, for this presentation about tools that will help you survive in the microservice architecture. So let's start with the agenda. Uh, first, we will, uh, I, I will shortly introduce myself. Then I will be uh, talking about centralized configuration, then distributed tracing, uh, and then health checking. And uh, hopefully, we will have some, uh, some time for questions and uh, answers. Uh, shortly about me, I'm a, I'm a software engineer with uh, more than 10 years of experience. Um, currently, I, was, uh, I work as an IT expert at uh, Roche. Uh, I used to work for telco, I used to work for uh, investment banking, uh, and now I work for pharma. And I'm specialized in uh, Java, um, Scala, and uh, right now a little bit uh, cloud. Uh, uh, I didn't know how to start this presentation, so I decided to start with, uh, with some art. This is a painting from 18th uh, century by Canaletto, and, and the title is um, Army of Contractors Migrating to Microservices. So, I, I'm a really huge fan of this website, so if you don't know it, just go there and, and uh, have fun. Um, so, for whatever reasons you ended up in, in microservice architecture, so it might be migration from uh, a legacy system, it might be uh, starting from scratch uh, for different reasons, uh, you will have some benefits from this approach. You will, uh, you will get scalability, you will be able to choose best technology for, uh, for your concrete task to, to, to do. Uh, your teams will have ownership of, of components uh, of your system, so, uh, so you can be more effective. And of course, you will have better CVs uh, when, uh, when you finish uh, such a project. But uh, what you will also have, that you will also have some downsides of, uh, of this architecture. So basically, it's more difficult to develop microservices than just monolithic applications uh, in, some, uh, in some aspects. It's uh, more difficult to manage, uh, manage microservices. It, it's more difficult to, uh, to, to handle production environments and, and all, other, uh, all other environments, basically. Um, so let's move to another classic. This is Uncle Bob, uh, who said, Truth can only be found in one place, the code. And usually, as developers, we, we stick to it. We uh, believe this is true. And we store our, uh, our work in uh, uh, source control management systems, like Git, like SVN uh, uh, previously. Um, so this allows us to work as a team. Uh, it it uh, allows us to, to have better cooperation uh, while doing our job. Uh, it's easy to track changes. It's easy to apply new. Uh, it's easy to apply a review process to all changes to, to our code, and uh, we also have uh, backups, so we can move back to uh, to what, whatever point uh, in our code we want. Uh, but uh, it's not always the case when we talk about configuration, because our systems require the. the the code, the, the runtime code we, uh, we need to develop, but they also require configuration properties, a bunch of configuration properties, and this can be uh, URLs uh, to, to other systems, this can be um, database uh, passwords and database uh, addresses and, and so on, you all know this uh, stuff. And uh, in distributed systems, so also microservices are, uh, are distributed systems, it's extremely difficult to, uh, to know what the state of the system uh, uh, is when we don't have uh, configuration centralized. And that's why I, I would like to talk to you about centralized configuration. Um, uh, this can be some kind of confusing because uh, to have centralized configuration, you need to externalize it. But this is just a matter of uh, perspective. So you make the configuration external from, from your components, from your services, but you keep it in a central, uh, central place where can be, it can be served for, uh, for other components. Um, this is a project I'm currently working on. It's an architecture or a little bit also uh, infrastructure diagram. And 
don't look at the details, it's not important. It's just uh, to show that systems uh, in, in, uh, in, um, um, in this period of time that we are uh, working on are uh, more and more complex. So we have uh, systems that we, want, we need to integrate with, we have our own components, we have uh, different type of clients. Uh, and also different runtimes, so, so different languages, different, uh, um, different communication channels, for example. So sometimes we communi communicate over REST, sometimes we communicate over uh, message bus, which, which can be Kafka or RabbitMQ or, or whatever. And uh, there is this idea to keep our all configuration properties in a central place that is backed uh, with some uh, tool that will, uh, that will allow us to keep it as a, as a code. And, uh, and how we can do that? The, the method of centralized configuration is language agnostic, but in our case, uh, we use Spring Cloud Config for, uh, for this. Um, so Spring Cloud Config is a, is a library, uh, is a tool, uh, under the, the Spring umbrella, uh, which has two sides, so uh, config server and uh, config client. So to run con uh, configuration server, Spring configuration server, we need a Maven dependency, which is uh, shown on the slide, and uh, then we can use the enable config, uh, config server annotation in our Spring Boot application, and uh, basically that's it. We don't need to code anything. Of course, we need to configure something. Uh, that's uh, always uh, something to be, to be configured. But it's, uh, it's to limit the number of properties we need to put uh, in our configuration at the runtime. And the only thing we, we do this, uh, we, we do here, is providing uh, Git URI to, to our rep Git repository. This can be different backend, but I'll, I'll, talk, uh, I'll uh, tell about this uh, in a few minutes. And, of course, uh, a fast phrase so, so we can access the repository. Um, and also we need to configure security for our configuration server so we, uh, so we are sure that only uh, authorized uh, clients can, can connect to it and can, uh, can use the properties. And uh, now the client side. We have, uh, of course, uh, dependency. Uh, just one single dependency. And then we have uh, uh, this possibility to just remove application YAML from, uh, from our uh, components. What we need to deliver is uh, addre address to the configuration server, and we provide it in Bootstrap uh, YAML, as it is uh, shown here. So basically, it's the URI of, uh, of the server running we, uh, that, that we configured in, in the previous step. And basically, that's it. So, if you use Spring, uh, how many of you does, do, does use Spring? Yeah, um, yeah, so, so you are all familiar with uh, environment abstraction and uh, all uh, features that it uh, provides, like uh, the, the value annotation, uh, will work as uh, as previously. But you will need, you will not uh, you, you will be able to download all your properties from the server. Okay, so we have configuration options, and uh, we can have our properties stored uh, in different type of backends. So usually, it's uh, source control management systems like Git or SVN, but it also can be a file system, which is uh, useful when when you uh, locally develop something. Uh, it can be HashiCorp uh, Vault, which is a convenient way to store secrets. It can be JDBC, Redis, uh, so more like database approach. It, ha it can be Cred Hub, which is from Cloud Foundry. And uh, you also have this option to compose this backend. So you can set different priorities. So for example, first try to, to find these uh, properties in the database. But if you, you, you cannot find it, just go to SVN or Git, and you will, you will have it. Uh, it all depends on your requirements. If single SCM is, uh, um, is enough for you, just go for it. 
security. So, of course, uh, our configuration properties need to be secure, so we can uh, set up uh, basically everything uh, which is uh, supported by Spring uh, natively. So, in the, in the simplest uh, scenario, it is a basic authentication over HTTP, but this can be OAuth or any other security mechanism uh, you want. And uh, what's also a very nice feature, it's uh, encryption. So you, you don't want to store plain text passwords in your repositories, that's like obvious. However, I, 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 I uh, experienced uh, plain text passwords in uh, repositories for production uh, systems. But to avoid that, uh, Spring uh, Cloud Config allows you to encrypt uh, your uh, secrets with uh, symmetric or asymmetric uh, keys and store uh, passwords in, this, uh, in a secure way. It exposes uh, two endpoints, encrypt and decrypt, which can be used for encryption and decryption of, uh, of, the, of the secrets. And then you just uh, need to, the, the specific form of cipher and then just uh, encrypted password in your repository. And all you need to provide to decrypt it is uh, encrypt key uh, variable. Uh, which can be delivered to server. That this means uh, the, the decryption will happen on, on the server side, or you can uh, deliver it to your client uh, components, and uh, it will be decrypted uh, on the client side. And some hints from our experience, from, from our project. Uh, first of all, uh, you need to think of your requirements. So you, you need to um, decide what backend structure is uh, best fitted for your uh, needs. Uh, so you, you need to decide if you want to have uh, one repository per, uh, per, uh, per component, per your service, or maybe you want uh, like common repository for uh, all your um, services that, uh, that will allow you to have all configuration properties uh, in the same place and also to reuse uh, some uh, higher level uh, properties. In our case, uh, it's enough to have uh, one repository for all our services, so we, we know exactly how the system configuration looks, uh, looks like just but, but by looking at the repository. And then you need to decide if you want to uh, have a branch per, uh, per your environment, or maybe you can uh, use uh, the same branch, but with different Spring profiles. In our case, Spring profiles uh, work good, and, uh, and we stick to it. Um, there is some useful um, properties you probably want to set to be true. Uh, clone on start, it means that uh, server will, uh, when started, it, it will try to clone the repository uh, just after, after the start. Otherwise, you, you might end up in a situation where your, when, uh, when your configuration server starts without signaling any errors, but uh, then when clients want to connect to it, uh, it, it throws some errors. So in my opinion, it's better to fail fast and, uh, um, and don't start the server, just, uh, just signal an error so we can fix it. Um, this is something that can be important uh, for not ephemeral environments. If you have your uh, services wrapped up in uh, Docker containers, probably it's not, Im not important to you. But this means that uh, if something changes on the file system, you are uh, downloading the configuration, uh, it, will, it will be forced. So, so um, you are sure that uh, nothing changed there and there will not be any errors uh, when, when the repository when on the hard drive changes. Um, of course, you want to make the, the configuration server resilient. So uh, you, you made it central place of your application and all your components depend on it. So run multiple instances uh, of the server behind some kind of load balancer and this is uh, extremely important. Your system will not work without, uh, without configuration server. Um, if you use Spring Boot, boot uh, Actuator, uh, just remember you have this refresh uh, endpoint and refresh scope annotation, so you can uh, actually uh, refresh your properties without, uh, without a need to restart uh, the, the, the components. And if you, you are using uh, Spring Cloud Bus, you can use push notifications so all instances in your system will refresh uh, their properties when, when it's required. 
Uh, there is also uh, a way to uh, to handle non-Spring components. So Spring, uh, so uh, maybe your services are written in different language and you have different runtimes, and they don't have uh, the the environment abstraction of Spring. Uh, because from, by default, when you access the, uh, the, the properties uh, from the server, it, they, they will be delivered as a JSON uh, file, as JSON, in, a, in a JSON format. But uh, for some uh, cases, uh, for some use cases, it's more useful to have them uh, listed as uh, YAML or uh, property files. And uh, this is also uh, possible, and there are endpoints for that. And uh, for, uh, for components that have uh, their own uh, configuration format, like for example Nginx, uh, you can use um, plain text endpoint and uh, your plain text uh, variable, uh, plain text uh, configuration will be, will be served uh, from the server. So uh, basically this is it about uh, Spring Cloud Config. Um, and we can move to another topic. And we will do that with a quote again. So this one is from, uh, from unknown source. Theory is, is when you know something, but it doesn't work. Practice is just when something works, but you don't know why. And programmers combine theory and practice. Nothing works, and they don't know why. Uh, uh, the source is unknown, but probably all of you can e experience that uh, in your uh, in your life. And uh, there is a, a special case for, for, this, uh, for this quote in distributed systems where uh, the, uh, there might be another part added to that and you don't even know where to start looking uh, what's wrong. So there is a method to, to help you deal with that and this is uh, distributed tracing. So. Again, let's look at, uh, at some uh, example systems. So let's say that uh, our um, user clicks something in, in the UI, and uh, usually when you have a service architecture, you, hence, you have some kind of a gateway. So your request fer first goes to, um, uh, to the gateway, and something can go wrong here. You can have uh, routings uh, not correctly defined, and it will fail here. But if everything goes well, it, uh, it will be routed to, uh, to the service responsible for handling this request. And if, if everything is fine, it will be just answered and, and uh, OK. But the reality is not uh, that simple uh, always. So uh, sometimes you need to communicate with other system to get some information that can be used by the, 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 the previous one. And of course, something can go, uh, can go wrong here. Um, and uh, as I said before, we have different communication channels. So for example, we can uh, publish some event that will trigger a different component uh, um, without any um, we, without notifying the user that something went wrong, but actually the action of the user was a, was a source cause for an error of, the applica of, of some other component in our system, but the communication was asynchronous and we didn't know uh, about that. Okay, so how to solve that? Uh, we need to uh, introduce distributed tracing identifiers in our, uh, in our log files. So basically, the, the first three are the most important. The third, uh, fourth one is for uh, sampling. Uh, I I'm, I'm, I'm will not focus on that uh, right now. It's just for collecting information about uh, performance or uh, failures in our system, but uh, in, it's more for uh, like push notifications and, for example, to collect them in Zipkin. Uh, but Let's focus on this three first. Um, so we have tr trace ID, span ID, and parent span ID. All of them are uh, random numbers, usually 64 or 128 uh, uh, bits long. And uh, the idea is that when we start uh, processing some request, we put a uh, random span ID and trace ID identifier in this request. And then subsequent requests to different components uh, are uh, um, handled in the way that we 
uh, randomly select new span ID for logically separate, separated actions in different components, but we rewrite the, the trace ID. So trace ID is unique for entire system, but is, uh, but is common for whole uh, span tree. And, and the thing goes. So, uh, and also, of course, we uh, also assign parent span, uh, span ID uh, taken from, from the previous call. And by this simple uh, method, we are able to span entire tree of our invocation uh, from, uh, from the originated from the same request. Uh, how can we do that? Of course, we can implement it by, our, by ourselves, but if we are using uh, Spring, Spring Boot, we can, uh, we can add a dependency Spring Cloud Sleuth to our, uh, to our components, and, uh, and that's it. It should be uh, transparent to the users, and uh, you will get some things uh, out of the box. You will get some ingress and egress points that are, will be handled uh, without any uh, coding or configuration from your site. So first you will get servlet filter uh, handling uh, tracing identifiers, so whenever something comes to your servlets, uh, the, the context will be updated with, uh, with new span, uh, and the, 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 the other spans and trace ID will be rewritten if it's present uh, in the request. Uh, so the context will be Mm, updated, and whenever you log uh, something using your logger, loggers like logback, it will be uh, put into your logs. Uh, you have REST templates, so whenever you use uh, uh, outgoing communication, uh, HTTP communication in your Spring, in spring applications, uh, also, uh, scheduled actions, if you have a scheduled annotation in your Spring applications, uh, then all these uh, invocations uh, from the scheduler will also update the context and start new new span. Uh, you will have message channels uh, if you use uh, message channels in your applications, so things like uh, uh, message queues, uh, Kafka, Rabbit will be handled uh, in the same way without any um, coding from your site. Zool fil filters, faint clients, if you use them, this is also by default. But sometimes you need to, or you want to, um, implement uh, uh, ingress, uh, uh, ingress or egress channels from, um, by your own, and there is an easy way to do that. You just need to uh, put a new span annotation on the method that you, need to, uh, that you want to be um, treated separately and uh, that you want to have separate uh, randomly selected span IDs um, like here. We, we do it, for example, because we have some ingre uh, ingress channels from uh, TC plain TCP socket, and this is not handled by Spring uh, by default, but it's very easy to implement. Okay, so what changes if you add this uh, library to your Spring Boot applications? You will have your logs uh, looking like it was before, but you will have some random numbers and uh, sampling state as a Boolean value uh, in your logs. And uh, this is uh, useful by itself, uh, because then you can uh, match all, all uh, actions related to, to a single origin uh, at this point. Uh, but what we found uh, very useful is to have uh, front-end connected um, also with the tracing mechanism. So whenever something happens on our, uh, in our uh, UI, so whenever, for example, we get uh, error response from uh, backend, like 500, something happened, uh, we send our logs, uh, our front-end logs to Logstash, uh, and we put uh, tracing identif uh, span. Uh, trace ID coming from backend in the, in the logs, and whenever uh, a user is logged in, we also put uh, user information, uh, like user ID, uh, in the logs. Um, and the, the, the most powerful uh, method to utilize these tracing identifiers to have a log, uh, is to have a, a log management system. Uh, we use ELK. Uh, log management is a topic for different uh, presentation, but we use log man management uh, from, uh, from uh, Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. These are uh, all uh, open source components you can use to collect and transform your logs. Then Elasticsearch is to index, search, and analyze. 
uh, the logs and Kibana is to visualize and, and manage, uh, manage the logs. And uh, real life scenario, so we, we got a um, error report from our users and usually it's like it happened between 7.20 and 7.30 today and uh, I, I got an error and basically this is it. And we know the, the reporting user uh, ID. Uh, so we enter our Kibana. Uh, this is the, the standard view for, uh, for discovering logs. But we can use uh, filters then. We can narrow down the time range we want to use. So the error happened be between 7.20 and 7.30. And uh, the user ID was like this. And what we have, we have only one, uh, we, we have only one entry in our, uh, in our log. And this, is, um, this, this entry is from UI, as we expect. But what we have inside is trace ID. And just by modifying the filter, uh, just by modifying the filter to reflect, um, to, to search for, for this trace ID, we, we are able to analyze the whole execution chain. So our, uh, our um, request started, uh, started in some service, then it communicated to some other service. Of course, Gateway was on, uh, was on its way. But we are able to trace the log uh, down to the, uh, to the root cause. In this, in this case, it was quite, uh, quite serious uh, SQL uh, error. But, and, and fixing this is, of course, a matter of uh, something else. The identifiers won't help you to fix that, but it will, tr it will help you to, uh, to, to, to find the, um, the reason quickly. So it took us two minutes to, to find the root cause after we got the, the incident report. Uh, with, without, the, without tracing identifiers and without uh, keeping all logs in a logs, uh, uh, log management system, it would take us much more and probably we wouldn't be sure that, uh, that the reason is 100% related uh, to, the, to the bug report uh, f from the user. And of course, uh, you need to remember that all services are running in multiple instances and uh, just logging into it and f searching for errors for specific time, it's, uh, it's, it's a very difficult uh, thing to do. Um, and you need, uh, according to, uh, to the Murphy's Law, you need to f it will be in the last instance you, you are trying to, to log in. Uh, okay, so this is it about tracing, uh, about uh, distributed tracing. Um, and let's move to the, the, the last quote of uh, today's presentation. And uh, this one is from uh, 1987, so it's more than 30 years old. And it's from uh, Leslie uh, Lamport. Um, and it's uh, a distributed system is one in which uh, the failure of a computer you didn't know existed can render your own computer unusable. So this uh, quote is from is 20, 30 years old, but it's uh, still ac uh, ac uh, accurate, and um, it's getting more and more accurate when uh, when we um, introduce uh, distributed uh, systems when we go through f for the microservice ar architecture in our companies, in our uh, daily work. Uh, so um, just to know what, what is wrong and uh, if your system is uh, uh, usable or not, you need health checking for that. So let's get back to, to, the, to the system, to the diagram, and this is like Normal. So something can go wrong uh, in here, but what does it mean? Does it mean that uh, that your system is completely unusable right now? So, or maybe it's just limited functionality. It should be limited functionality because this is what uh, microservices promise. But uh, this uh, error can propagate to some other services because they they, they use it. Uh, they use the the previous uh, the previous service that was uh, uh, not running well. Um, and this can go, all, of course, with uh, external systems, uh, which can cause some, some our functionality to, uh, to downgrade and uh, our system to be just unusable. 
Okay, so why to health check? Um, first reason in the distributed systems, in the modern systems, is orchestrators. So orchestrators like Kubernetes or uh, Marathon or whatever use uh, health checks for provisioning of services, scaling, load balancers also need to know which service can be used for, uh, for uh, distributing the, the traffic. And also for restarting uh, failing instances, they, they exactly know, need to know which uh, instance should be restarted or maybe moved to some other node uh, in our cluster where, where it can run fine. Uh, we use health checks for uh, monitoring systems, uh, so we can have alerting functionality. So when you sleep at night and something uh, ha uh, wrong happens, you can get uh, an, uh, an SMS or, or email or whatever, uh, just to know that, uh, that you should react. Uh, you can also use health checks for trends, so you know exactly uh, what is your uptime, uh, what is uptime of your system, what is uh, downtime of your system, and uh, make some SLAs or whatever um, from that. And uh, it's also important that health checks are for people. So uh, whenever you uh, want to know if your service is running, you have a single endpoint to, to check that. So it's just for your developers and your operation team to better understand what happened, what, what happens, what's the state of the system, so we can react faster and we can deliver value to our uh, users. Um, and some hints how to health check. First of all, uh, we need to know uh, where the problem is. So we need to uh, distinguish between the, co the failure of the component itself or its dependencies. So the most, imp uh, but still the most important uh, question is: uh, Is the component, uh, component usable? So probably we don't need to check any uh, all dependencies from this component. We need just to know if it's doing its uh, its job, and this should be what health check um, says. Not only just simple uh, endpoint that will. Uh, respond HTTP 200 when the, the service can, uh, can be accessible. Uh, you need to see the big picture, so understand your dependencies. Um, because from perspective of a single, single service, like a little delay in response time can be perfectly fine and uh, you consider it healthy. But this can be uh, um, problematic for uh, your dependent systems. And uh, this delay can, uh, can affect some timeouts defined somewhere else, and you, may, you will make uh, the, the, the bigger part of your system unusable. Uh, you, for sure, you want to standardize. So uh, whenever you write health checks, just do it in the same way for all components in your system. Use the same format so you can reuse your uh, mechanism for alerting, for monitoring, without uh, adjusting just a single component. And uh, use uh, a standard HTTP codes. This is important for uh, orchestrators because they uh, always uh, uh, they always consider uh, codes, uh, HTTP codes, between 200 and 400 as healthy. Anything else will be treated as unhealthy, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the services will be, the instances will be restarted. Uh, what, uh, what do we use for, uh, uh, for health checking? We use uh, Spring Boot Actuator. Um, and as always in Spring, it's very easy to add this. It's a dependency, a single dependency. By introducing this dependency, you will uh, have uh, different endpoints uh, exposed by your application. One of them will be health, uh, which I'm just focusing right now. But we will also have some info where you can put, for example, uh, git hash of your uh, of your code base so you exactly know what is running uh, what is running in your in your environment you have some metrics you have traces and many many more it's very useful but uh, uh, it's a topic for another speech maybe a book and it's uh, an example um, response from health endpoint it's JSON, as you can see, so it can be consumed from, by other systems. Uh, Spring, by default, uh, also checks for dependencies. So, for example, if you have a database connection uh, in your application, it will check if it's healthy or not. 
uh, and uh, it will sum up to the, to the application state um, in, in overall. So status of this service is currently up because all of the, its dependencies are, uh, dependencies are up. Uh, you can also have custom health checks, um, and this is useful to answer this question if your service is usable. So you can, um, you can um, implement health indicator uh, interface in your application and mark it as a Spring component. So whenever uh, the service is uh, asked for its health, it will also invoke this one. And uh, in this part, you can, uh, you can implement something that is meaningful to your application, to your, to your domain, or uh, just to answer if the service is usable. Uh, when you have uh, health checks defined for all your components of your system, it's easy to build dashboards. It can be like uh, some commercial tool, but probably there are some... Uh, some open source tools or you can develop something by your own and you have clear overview over uh, your system so you know if it's running or not, which components are uh, green and, and healthy and which are uh, just failing. And uh, you also can have uh, trends in forms of uh, charts, diagrams and, and so on. Okay, so this is, uh, this is everything uh, from me. And uh, here are resources, or are public, publicly available and well, well documented. Um, I hope you find it useful and uh, just enjoy it.